Hello, dear listeners, and welcome to the historic event that is episode 100 of the Agile podcast. I'm Jeff Watts, and I got together with my good friend Paul Goddard to record this landmark episode where we started off talking about the usual nonsense, such as what's been changing for us recently after our summer hiatus, how our businesses have had to pivot, and how businesses in the wider world have had to pivot. And then we went almost back to basics, where we started talking about servant leadership, what it really means, and where it all came from. And a little bit of a digression around the community, the Agile community as it is right now. Well, it was good to get back to the podcast, And hopefully you'll enjoy joining us for this historic episode in more ways than one, actually, because we have a happy surprise for you after the jingle. suburb. Easy trip down the dual carriageway for you. Yeah, wasn't too bad. Wasn't too bad. A little in trip my, across in country my for daughter's me. little one litre Ford Fiesta. Oh, you got a new car. Was <laughs> it the blue one outside? Yeah, yeah. yeah with the Minnie Mouse balloons <laughs> in the front on the dashboard. Suits you, mate. Yeah. Suits you. My head touching this, touching the roof. Mm-hmm. A small car suits you. Yeah, but so it's good. It's easy to park, though, isn't it? That's the benefit. Easy to park. Yeah. Well, not as easy as the other one. It parked itself, but. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty easy to park. Yeah, but a bit of a come down from the you Tesla. Can, you can fit it into a space quite easily. Yeah. But yeah, well, nice to see you again, mate. Yeah, we were just trying to work out when we, how long it's been. Yeah, I reckon. It's been a long time. Nearly six months. Yes. Half a year. So it's kind of like, yeah, it's like a virtual Jeff for six months. Long time. But it's good to be back. Good to be back. I'm still an agile leadership coach. Yeah. How about you? Business changed? Um business changed slightly Got in so much as there's less of it deliveries and <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's a growth market isn't it what's that delivery delivery, delivery driver yeah yeah I, I could i was thinking i could do that i I'd sent some that. stuff off with the dhl guy uh this morning yesterday and he said never been busier never been busy i bet or if you're an amazon delivery driver i bet mm-hmm. you're busy um but no i'm not unfortunately i'm not in the market of PP, ppe which i wish i was apparently there's a someone was telling me company in Bristol uh, a, a single a guy in his garage bought a load of PPE just before mm. started his own PPE business just before March made three million pounds in six months um, mm. done very well out of his garage can he sleep at night though that's the question <laughs> <laughs> happy happy birthday oh really well you know happy, I've had a birthday happy birthday since, to the we, podcast oh right yeah <laughs> We've both, we've about both had a birthday since we've both a year old since we last did one of these. But yeah, this is it. This is an ar- completely arbitrary milestone. But this is episode one hundred. Cheers. Mm. Cheers, mate. We're still here. Who'd have thought it? After after what is it now? Probably four, four and a half years. It's still getting stronger, just like Jimmy Anderson. Yeah, 
600 wickets. Yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice, nice milestone. But I was never really no, bothered. There's no with that, marching band. There's no um, 24 gun salute. No, no flyover from the Red Arrows. I didn't didn't have time to arrange that. <laughs> no cake. No party hats. But but together, which is something that you wanted. Yeah. All through lockdown. So, oh, Jeff, 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 we've got to be back in the pub by <laughs> episode 100. We've got to be. And we are. There was despondency, wasn't there? There was despair. Yeah. We made it. But we're there. Yeah. yeah so you've had, a, you've had a bit of time off, haven't you? This month I have, yeah. Yeah. And really did try. It helped being, certainly last week I was in deepest, darkest, rural Wales. And it did help the fact there was no, no very little signal. And when there was signal, it was very poor. So. Camping? No, we had a, a cottage. We had an Airbnb mm. in the middle of nowhere, which on a kind of a, like a nice, a kind of a, a farm that's been reconverted to mm-hmm. pods and c- cottages. So it was, it was nice. And there was only about you know kind of eight um, res- accommodation um, families there. So it was nice. It was remote. It was uh, it wasn't very busy. Did a lot of walks, got, out, got outdoors. But yeah, I just tried to, because just before August, I was pretty busy. I was felt pretty snowed under. So I think mentally as well, it's good for me just to disconnect for a while. Mm. And I've had a good two and a half, three weeks off. So I've got no news, no, <laughs> no work news. <laughs> no, but I've got no. I've, got, I've just been nice for me to kind of <sighs> down tools for a bit. Yeah, good for you. Good for you. I haven't had a break. But. No, I was going to say you've. How you sound like you've been busy. Oh, bit busy-ish. You know, um, still got some, still got some people that I'm supporting, some teams I'm supporting, ideas that I'm germinating and feeding, yeah. testing. Um, has this has this time helped with that, or has it just accelerated that? Is it just? No, I, I actually imagined it would help more. Um, but I think I've had to put more effort in other areas than I, that I you know, didn't imagine. Um, so, no, I, I'm, it's, it's been different. It's been different. And, um, yeah, I, 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 I've gone back to my roots a little bit. Um, so I was asked to chair a track at the Agile Online Summit this year. Oh, yeah, I've seen you tweeting about that. And um, I, I asked, you know, what, what track do you want me to chair and Tom said well make one up <laughs> so I made one up and I've been going thinking about thinking a lot about how the term servant leader isn't particularly very well understood right and uh, you know, what it actually means and how it do, I don't think many people in the agile world actually have read Greenleaf stuff um, I think it's quite quite interesting and so I thought, well, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do a track on servant leadership. But because because of the remote nature of things, um, we'll we'll put the online spin on it. So what's the difference between a traditional servant leader, if you like, and, and one that's forced to operate online? Mm. And they've had some really interesting submissions. I'm looking forward to it, actually. It's, um, so basically I get, I get to pick five tracks and, and speak to people who've got different ideas about it. In okay. different parts of the world and with different lenses. Um. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. Let's get you busy then. When when is that? When's that summit? Well, so I'll be doing I'll be doing the interviews this month and next month, and then it's it's going to be live in October. Okay. So I'm as normal pre-crastinating yeah a lot doing of the other too tracks, much too soon a lot of the other tracks are sort of spacing it out I prefer to get things done yeah so I'll be uh, having my conversations soon looking forward to them I was supposed to have one this morning actually but um, things conspired against us mm-hmm. yeah I think it looks like a good good track there's um, there's women in agile track there's um, engaging agile leadership track there's there's all sorts of different tracks there's culture and technical practices and things so I've seen a lot of lot of that that kind of more creative ways of looking at trying to get people to connect online and stuff conferences or user groups 
and that all that stuff's become more accessible to everyone now, isn't it? The fact that you can be on the other side of the world as long as you're prepared to get up at different times. Yeah. Well, I was doing a set, doing a meetup group last night, and I think there were about people from about thirty different countries. Mm. It's quite incredible, really. Yeah. Um, but no, they're, they're aiming for about ten thousand people, I think. Wow. Yeah. Uh, one the, the one thing I really liked about it, which sort of tipped the balance in terms of me saying, yeah, all right, I'll put my time and energy into this, was the was the format of it. So. You and I are used to conferences or um, summits, gatherings where a speaker would submit a talk or a workshop. Yeah. Well, in this one, they submit a topic and an idea. Right. And I will interview them about it. Right. So they don't get to talk at me. Right. I get to ask them questions. They don't know where it's going to go and see where this conversation leads. Um, so that's the bits that's online, is the conversation? Yeah. Okay. So... Um, so yeah. it's like a fireside chat type thing. Pretty much, yeah. So I, I don't get to... All I get is the abstract uh, of their talk and a little bit of, you know, why why it's going to be important, why it's relevant, what's their experience, what are they hoping people will take away from it. But, um, yeah, they're not they're not in control. Yeah, so, so they've got to know their stuff for it. Well, yeah, well, like, either that or it's just... It, it can't it's be... It's an interesting topic. It can't be a sales pitch. It no. can't be a, you know, I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. They can't rehearse yeah. it. They can't read a script. Um, which I personally quite like mm. not because I want people to be on edge but I just want it to be a little bit more real a little bit more you know, from the heart it's, they've, got to, they've got to really live their stuff yeah. to be able to have those kinds of conversations and be interesting, interested and interesting enough mm. to, to engage a conversation about it a little bit of a challenge for me as well because I don't know what they're going to say so. so you're playing Michael Parkinson kind of for our international listeners Michael Parkinson very famous interviewer had his own talk show good at asking the right questions mm. in a kind of homely kind of warm way <coughs> yeah not your Howard Stern shock jock type. no very much a sit and sit in front of the fire for a nice chat very good mm. so you're a busy boy I'm busy enough you know I think it's it's a it's a, a good opportunity to to really focus so you know I haven't done hardly any training no which which has made me think actually that's that's the direction I want to continue going in away from training yeah um, even more than I have been so yeah I'm having different conversations with different people yeah and focusing on different things which is good I think I think I'm getting a lot more a lot more contacts people have started there was there was a period where I didn't really get many emails from from people yeah it was noticeably dry yeah um, well I'll I'll caveat that and say, so those are screams of happiness by the way <laughs> children thoroughly enjoying the play we're not in some nearby. kind of dungeon to- torture um, situation but yeah I think the, the, the types of contact I got have changed had changed quite considerably so I got very few requests for you know, internal training classes and things like that, but I got a lot of requests for speaking. Yeah. So I would get sort of five requests to speak every week at least. Yeah. And different things. Um, but n- almost none from companies saying, oh, we'd like to we'd like to give our some scrum masters a bit of training or you know, mm. we'd like to, we'd like to talk to our product owners or something like that. Mm. So, um, yeah, that completely changed. But I think it's, you know, people are starting to, to come out. I've had a few few companies contact me about getting things going again okay um, online albeit online so that I think yeah we've kind of crossed that point where the brakes went on when and now that I think a lot more companies are used to the fact well this is going to be online for, online for a while or remote for a while how can we just carry on and adapt how we deliver various things to mm. that way so hopefully yeah it's, it's given me the opportunity so I've been pushing my whole improv thing that that uh, so I wrote this new course when did I write it June time May June something that I probably was always going to wanted to do anyway but just never had the time now yeah. I have the time and the the focus the direction the push rewrote it into five modules it's, it, to be fair it's done incredibly well so it's that's kind of kept me busy it's kind of more so than anything scrum related anything certified from the scrum alliance type thing but it same seems like different types of training and it's 
more modular and people can um, it's more flexible mm. and it's less intensive so yeah that's kind of kept me busy really it's kind of given me a bit of hope that um, to push this, that's the thing that I kind of imagined I would end up doing longer term so it's perhaps it's just it's kind of sped that up for me a little bit really mm. which is nice it's been I think it's been I've, I found it quite interesting to not only see what we talk about every day every week for the last 20 years in action in a much more pressurized focused way mm. so companies having to to react and pivot yeah. to really big challenges but also having to uh, as as we used to say at bt eat our own dog food mm -hmm. or drink our own champagne exactly yeah. um so you know, the, the almost everyone is is looking at their business models and thinking you know is this fit for purpose anymore and um pivoting that and you know, the fact that some I, I i found it quite useful to have a a pretty varied pipeline, if you like, lots of different types of work. Yeah. And some some have flourished and some have floundered in yeah. when the circumstances change, and that's from a resilience point of view. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, others others haven't, you know. And if you're too reliant on one thing and the market conditions change, you can become extinct pretty quickly, no matter yeah. how strong you are. Yeah. And those conditions are significantly changed i'd realized we hadn't said what we were drinking I'm, I'm, <laughs> we're, out um, of, we're out of practice mate we are we are i'm um I, I didn't really have to be honest a great choice it was lager lager or lager pretty much compared to what, at home you were probably a bit more experimental with what you were buying but when yeah. you're in a pub you you think there'd be more but there's actually probably less isn't there less mm. choice so i'm drinking a, a moretti an italian lager which wouldn't be my choice but it was better than Foster's and Carling. Well, I'm drinking Stouford. Stouford Press? I, but I haven't had a pint of Stouford. Because you don't tend to see Stouford in cans in the supermarket as much as you see you matches, no. I mean, you should do, really, because it's all local stuff and it's all West Country based, but it's harder to... It's more surprising sometimes. Maybe it's just the supermarket I was going to, but mm. it's nice to have a Stouford every now and again. But one of the pubs near me has gone into administration. Is it? The Castle. I've been there. Yeah, you probably have. On the right? roundabout. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so it's, I think a guy bought it just before, in February, like before lockdown, invested a lot of money in it, and then COVID, and it's gone into administration since, since then, so. It's a freehold, was it? It was, yeah, it used to be brewery owned, but I think this guy literally bought it off the brewery in February. Tough. Yeah. So, one of many businesses, I think, that will. But yeah, it's that explore versus exploit, isn't it? Mm. About whether you're willing to. And I've obviously, myself, I've had to diversify, and you do. You know, you know um, necessity is the mother of all invention, isn't it? So, that trying to push yourself into different areas. But I'm quite pleased. I've been, I feel like I've been busy even though I've not been busy. Yeah. So from the balance sheet point of view, I'm not very busy. No. But from my brain point of view, I feel like I have been busy. Well, it's a completely different part of the product life cycle, isn't it? You, yeah. You kind of, yeah, going almost in startup mode. And you go, you've got to invest, know what to invest in and and kind of ideas that you want to back and, and ideas that you want to kind of leave behind. And So yes, it's been good for me, really. Probably, it's probably been good for me in that, in that respect. Because I think I was getting a little bit comfortable and a little bit complacent mm. yeah it's, 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 uh, it's, well, it's how you respond to it isn't it you can see it as a threat you can see it as an opportunity um, that, that kick up the arse that you've been waiting for yeah yeah it's good yeah it doesn't seem uh, when I look at the wider agile world at the moment I, I see uh, I see a lot of fighting again it's yeah I mean I try, I'm not as, I'll be honest, I'm not probably as clued up as others are and I see a little bit of it, I don't see all of it, I don't spend, I try not to spend too much time on social media and by that I mean try immersing myself in it, in, in the, um, hmm. in the discussions and the, uh, the comments but I see, yeah, I see a lot more, um, what's the word, volatile. Hmm. Um, I did read, the, I, I read the court transcript from the Scrum Alliance versus Scrum Inc. So you have to update me because I knew that there was problems but 
from what I've seen, it's all blown up more recently, and that's probably since I've been on holiday. So yeah. So I'll, can I'll, you over, give an overview? Well, it's so uh, the the court transcripts public record. You can you can go and see what the judge um, judge said. Uh, anyone can see it. Uh, but the, basically, the, the scrumming. So that's um, Jeff Sutherland and JJ Sutherland's company, uh, who run Scrum at Scale. They've they've been handed an injunction, so they're not allowed to run their uh, some of their courses. And it's based on the fact that they allegedly deliberately um, set their courses up to create confusion in the market. So they, they, they copied the logos, the learning objectives and so on of the Scrum Alliance courses uh, to sort of piggyback on their on their work. Really? Um, and so while they're, they claim there's all sorts of other aspects to the litigation that I don't really understand, but the, um, the, yeah, the, so far, while the rest of the court case continues, the judge has put an injunction in place against Scrum Inc. Um, so it's, it's, um, you know, it's a shame that, that it's, it's, you see this, this fighting again. You've seen, we've seen it before, you know, we've seen really good parties fall out. But that's not, I don't, that's, that's not necessarily a sign of the times, is it? That was something that's been bubbling away for a while, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's anything from the last six months no. or so. But um, so that Scrum Inc. aren't allowed to do to, to, to any tra any training. Or I don't not? know whether they're allowed to do any training, but they they um, there are certain courses that that they are running that they're no longer allowed oh, to I run. Oh, I see. While the courts, while the courts hear out the rest of it. Um, Is just the CST? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. And JJ still a CST? Was he a CST? I don't believe he was, was, was he? he? We need Nigel, Nigel would know. Mm. So yeah, I see that and um, that's a bit disappointing. Yeah. Not a hundred, not completely surprising if I'm honest, but disappointing nonetheless. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, so I was witnessing some of their arguments on social media, which again, try and, try and stay out of, but it's, you know, it was. It sort of goes in waves, doesn't it? There was, there was quite a lot of animosity a long time ago, and then there was an effort to bring bring people together and focus on what we agree on and you know, our common strengths and things. Mm. Um, and then it dis, dis went away again, and, that, and more arguments and sort of comes and goes really in waves. Yeah. There's 20 years since the Agile Manifesto next year. Yes. Which is another. 20, arbitrary milestone 2021 20, isn't it yeah uh, but I know that Scott Sivright is trying to organise a 20 year retrospective and he's got a lot of people involved yeah um, just to look back and sort of hold the mirror up and think well where, where do we go next do we need with the original as well, many of the original authors as you can he's or? trying I is think it? yeah um, pretty sure he's got Ron involved um, Alistair Coburn yeah yeah, there, I think there was. I think maybe. Yeah, Van Benekem, I think was maybe. Okay. But yeah, I think there were there were quite a few. Um, another another you know agile names that you'd be aware of that, yeah. that are influential. Um, yeah, it could be. It's one of those things that could be amazing and could be an absolute. But yeah, hats but off I to do, for trying. Yeah, I, th I think maybe there's a bit of confirmation bias from my own perspective here. But when you are when you've got maybe when let's say then there's less work happening and, and obviously there's a lot there's lockdowns and people have got a lot more time they they're attracted to that kind of news that kind of controversy that kind of social media and that's where i get i'm guilty of this myself i get you get most of my updates from is is linkedin or twitter or wherever it might be devil makes use for idle hands yeah so the phrase? yeah but yeah. the people have that time that they'll and i've noticed that as well that comments seem to be a lot more quick and there's a lot more things can um, um, exacerbate really quickly that's the wrong word but, but escalate really quickly because mm. pe all of a sudden you've got 100 comments on, the, on a thread and it's like I know controversy brings that controversy anyway but it just seems that people have got that time and it's just a little bit more bitey a little bit, <laughs> a little bit more um, just, yeah. it just made me laugh I saw one of the most um, most commented threads on Twitter the other day I just stumbled across it some guy said look I'm sorry I know this is going to upset people but coffee just tastes the same it doesn't matter what bean it is it doesn't matter where it's from doesn't matter if it's been pooed out by a monkey in the depths yeah. of Indonesia it's just coffee yeah 
um, and coffee lovers just went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. just like yeah. petrol, it's plane, like and stand back. I watched um, <laughs> this was you. I think you'll have seen the same thing. The Ricky Gervais Humanity. I think it's his stand-up show. And he talks about Twitter. He, he, and he metaphorically describes Twitter. It's yeah. like having a notice board in the middle of a town centre and somebody writes up guitar lessons, phone here. And Twitter is basically someone walking up to that saying, ringing the number saying, I don't want guitar lessons! <laughs> down the phone. So it's not, those messages are not meant for you, so don't respond to them. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's very true how he describes it, really. It is, yeah. It's, some of the stuff is very inflammatory and I, I try and distract myself from it really as much as I can. It is hard though. I feel the need, I, the need to, uh, I feel I need to have a voice there but I don't necessarily want to be there. Hmm. Well, I tweeted something the other day. I was amazed. So I, w I went through Greenleaf stuff again and just looking for tweetable things just to try and get other people in the industries awareness yeah. to it um, and it is amazing how so much of the stuff that we come to take as new yeah he was talking about 50 60 years ago yeah and he's not claiming he was new then either no uh, people like Peter Senge people like Stephen Covey they were all influenced by um, by him and one of the things that I've, I've mentioned before but in very different words and must have completely forgotten where I got that inspiration from was wait before you know it's silence it's a devastating question to ask but it's necessary how am I sure that I'm going to add value above and beyond this silence mm. and if the answer is yes that's devastating to hear because you think you should be able to add value <laughs> but don't talk unless you need to talk mm. uh, and that I think that you know, I talked I was asked a question yesterday about um what are the key characteristics of a, of, a, of a servant leader? And I hadn't really thought of it before. I hadn't, really, I hadn't come up with an acronym or anything. Um, but one of the things that I said was around, well, humility and reflection, flexibility. But that humility of, well, do you know what? I might be wrong here, so I'm just going to hold back. Mm. And maybe my opinion isn't needed right now. Mm. My opinion might, even if I'm right, my opinion might not be needed. And might be unhelpful, even if I'm right which is perhaps a counterintuitive thing to think, but you, know, you find those servant leaders generally generally think that. A sense that... What's well, that, that phrase, you've used it before, listen, if they listen when, when I think I'm wrong, or something like that, or speak when I think I'm right. Yeah, argue as if you're right. That's right. Listen, listen as if you're, if you're wrong. wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. In that sense, the other thing I thought was really important and relevant was this sense that you know, servant leaders generally look at something that's going on outside as not going on out there but going on inside i.e. it starts with me mm. so I can see a problem over there or I can see a problem with this relationship but is that problem really with that relationship or mm. does that problem start with me and whether it's right or wrong it's probably more helpful mm. to think that I think that's where you know, scrum masters look isn't it Look first yeah. within, look in the mirror first. Yeah. And we tell people, you know, the only person you can really change is the one in the mirror. Well, that's, and that's it. It's, you're expecting people to do the things in a certain way, but the number of people that, or scrum masters that I work with that, and I won't name names, but let's call them Ian, but mm. no, no, but um, would rather have emailed someone rather than pick up the phone and talk to them. Or, yeah. You know, just, it's, it's that. Are you you're expecting people to exhibit these principles but you're not doing it yourself themselves mm. and you're not acting in the way that you expect other people to act yeah hmm the other thing that I was asked yesterday which um, I thought was I spent a bit of time thinking about it is so one of the conversations that uh, one of the submissions to this track included a sort of subtopic so part of it was around servant leaders need to need to serve themselves as well as others so if you look at the scrum guide officially the scrum master who is a servant leader is expected to serve the product owners expected yeah. to serve the development team and serve the organization yeah 
which is great. Um, but there's nothing in there about who serves the scrum master. Where does the scrum master get help? Who who looks after them? Who makes sure they're okay? Yeah. Who makes sure their needs are satisfied and their needs are met? Yeah. And so, you know, one of the submissions is around, as a servant leader, you should serve yourself first. Now, that's in direct contradiction to Green Leaf. You said the servant leader serves other people first, but it's an interesting debate to have. Um, and, you know, who, who, who does do that? And uh, you, you, if you're no use to anybody, if you're burnt out, and we've talked before about putting your own oxygen mask on first yeah. and so on. But then it got me thinking about how, and again, we've probably had this conversation, if not directly, then over a couple of different sub part conversations in that if I spend a day coaching I could have six maybe even seven sessions in a day mm-hmm. and by the end of the day people are saying Christ Jeff you must be absolutely knackered I said oh, I've got more energy now than I did at the start of the day and it's mm-hmm. genuine it's true but one one day in a training class and I'm you know, lying in bed holding myself because I'm physically in pain um, so I'm more energized by a day being a servant leader than I am a day being an educator. Mm. Now I know other people who'd be the other way around, mm. but that to me says that that's more that's more natural for me. That's 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 where my strength is. Yeah. Uh, and so if you find yourself as a leader being drained at the end of the day while trying to be a servant leader, then and it's, it's not saying that you shouldn't be one, but it's, no. it's saying that it's it's more unnatural. It's too. more unnatural, yeah. Which okay, then you start picking that apart and how can I help myself with that regard and how can I work on some of those aspects so it becomes more natural and I think yeah there's a lot of leaders that where it is an effort and it is a it's an unnatural state for them especially maybe people that have been fast tracked through that that process mm. and maybe they haven't built those skills up over a long period of time maybe they've been they've you know, for whatever reason been shoehorned into something quite early on it's very unnerving if you're not used to that level of um Seniority, or whatever you're expected to do, responsibility, whatever, whatever it is. Yeah, for me, the the biggest biggest challenge for people in those regards, in that regard, is the definition of the internal definition of strong leadership. Mm. So they've traditionally been brought up on the view that you know, to be a strong leader, you need to make decisions, mm-hmm. you need to be in control, you need to have the answers, you need to give off an air of confidence and, and knowing and, and certainty. Uh, putting other people at ease, delegation and stuff like that, um, and that that's 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 great in some circumstances, but obviously in more complex environments, that's going to get you into problems. So you've been you've, you've you've got the culture that's expecting that type of leadership. You've been successful with that type of leadership, and now you need to change. So not only do you need to develop and learn different skills, more complementary skills. You have to let go of other habits and in the knowledge that, well, I would say with the lack of knowledge, with the lack of certainty that the environment is going to actually appreciate what you're doing because Mm. the culture still may well recognise and reward what you used to do. Mm. Um, And I think that's that's the number one challenge for a lot of leaders, even if they get it at an intellectual level, that emotionally and culturally it's Mm. still, there's some dissonance there. Well, just regardless of the industry, I was just listening on the radio on the way here that we live in a culture where, especially right now, especially right now, because of the levels of uncertainty we have, people are craving the opposite. They're craving, mm-hmm. they want, they're valuing decisiveness, certainty, and leaders in government or whatever that are prepared to, or, and the whole thing around the current, the U turn, and the, the old, the, 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 the government have gone back on a decision huge uproar you know, in, in the community that how, how dare these politicians admit that they're wrong but you know like saying in complex situations then there is a, there's there's an air of experimentation that you know what we made a bad call there I, find, I still find it fascinating I mean, it's just it's just because it's the forefront of my mind mm. but you know even even that was something that Greenleaf said. You know, so one of the biggest challenges you're going to face as a certain leader is people are going to want more certainty than you can provide. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, that's that, that is a challenge. People would prefer, he said, people will prefer order to chaos, even mm. if that order re- results in them having less freedom, mm. less happiness. Mm. They would prefer that to chaos. And so as a servant leader, helping them move towards that. And that's, you know, that's why he emphasised don't try and go from where you are to the end result straight away don't aim for perfect because mm. you, you won't get there and in the meantime people will just revert back it's got to be slowly mm. uh, it's, 
very prescient. And it, this, so when was his book pu published? Well, it wasn't really a book as such, it was just a set of essays. So The Servant as Leader was in 1960. Wow. Um, so you imagine he, he wrote that, 58, 59. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously it wasn't about Scrum, it wasn't about self But he was, his background was academia? No, so he worked at AT&T. Okay. Uh, and he was looking at organisational development culture there, but also uh, he was looking at culture in large institutions. So one of his other essays was called The Institution of Servants. So he was looking at, well, how do, how do institutions such as churches, governments, yeah. uh, banks, things like that, uh, encourage or discourage the right kind of behaviours? Um, and, you know, he's quite focused on the fact that uh, from a society point of view if you have this this hierarchy where you know, one person at the top and that, that pyramid then we're saying to our people that to, to be successful you need to aim to get to the top of the pyramid mm. now obviously by definition only one person can be at the top of the pyramid therefore everybody else is unsuccessful which mm. is toxic mm. and you get um, sabotage and you get all sorts of dysfunctional behavior to try mm. and achieve that whereas if if success is that by being at the bottom i've created more servants who want to help other people to be successful mm. then everyone can be successful at that mm. um, and you've got innumerable people helping you that's better for everyone mm. and yeah we may, we may view that as a philosophical idealistic stance but i think he was ahead of his time and said no, it's, it's not going to happen in my lifetime no but um and what if you are looking for that, whether at an organisational level or a, system, or a community level, while you're in the middle of it, you won't feel like anything's happening. You'll feel like things are standing still because you're in the middle of it. Yeah. Is he still around now? No. He, no. he died when? Couldn't tell you. I'd say in the 90s. But okay. Um, mm. Anyway, right on that note, cheers, cheers mate. Here's nice to, to another back. 100. Nice to be back. Cheers, everyone. Ta-da.